So welcome to numerical methods. We are still discussing generation of random numbers. And in our last session, we moved from the pseudo random numbers to the quasi random numbers. So looking at low discrepancy sequences. So in our section on random number generation, with the application of the Monte Carlo integration, Monte Carlo method in the background. We first discussed pseudo random number generation, the mass and twister, the linear concurrential random number generators. And then we came across the Coxma Lafka inequality, which showed us that the property that is really relevant here for our error estimate, so for the convergence rate, is the discrepancy. So the idea was then to generate a theoretically infinite sequence such that every subsequence has low discrepancy. So we can add more and more points to increase the accuracy, like for the true random numbers yeah, that are just independent samples, so independent from the previous points. But we would like to add it in such a way that every subsequence has low discrepancy. If we look at the one dimensional case, very nice, very prominent example is the Van der Korput sequence. So here the definition, the definition looked a little bit complicated, but if you just think, for example, for the case B equals two, then this just means that you take the binary, binary representation of the index um, and use it to create um, a fractional representation of a number between zero and one. So this is just a refinement scheme. So the first point is placed in the middle. And then if you looked, would like to refine this from one half, one half to a refinement where each interval has only size one over four, so four intervals of size one over four, you have a kind of refinement scheme. And the way this refinement is done is a bit special. Yeah? So the next refinement is one over eight. So I place the point here. And then the question is, where do you place the next point? Do you place the next point here? But that would leave you with a fairly large area where there is no point, right? So what you say is you take a large area where there is no point and you place it then here in the middle. And so the next point goes there and so on. So then you reach the next refinement level. So now I have everything refined to intervals of size one over eight. Okay, I will come back to this refinement and actually why it is better to do the refinement in this way compared to doing a refinement just going from left to right, yeah? that would also be possible. Uh, but you will see that actually this has a higher discrepancy. I will come back to this at the end of the session. So our next question is, how do we do low discrepancies sequences in higher dimension? And for that, just remember that we already had an algorithm that creates a vector valued sequence out of a one dimensional sequence. It was at the very beginning when I introduced the Monte Carlo method that we had this nice little picture. So if you have a sequence of IID random variables, taking one event of these will then be a sequence of random numbers. So this is a one dimensional sequence. Then you can use this one dimensional sequence to populate one after the other, the components of a vector. And actually this trivial algorithm was at the core of 
the feature that the Monte Carlo method has a convergence rate that is independent of the dimension because the convergence result actually didn't care if I was evaluating a function on a single element or of a vector of an element, if I'm just populating the components of the vector by these IID random variables. The sole increase in the overhead is that I need two elements here to create one element here. So it scales linear, the overhead scales linear and not exponential like for other integration rules. Um, so that was the sole thing. In the background, there is always the sequence of IID random variables, either a one-dimensional sequence or the sequence of IID components. So now it's the question, we have moved to low discrepancy sequences and the cox malavka inequality to the discrepancy. So we got rid of the probabilistic nature, which is nice, but can we still use this, which somehow relied on the probabilistic nature? So we need to discuss low discrepancy sequences in higher dimension. And before I start with this, I would like to do a small code experiment with you to just explore this problem. So let's just implement this algorithm that creates a multidimensional random number generator out of a one-dimensional generator. So we had here our one dimensional generator interface. And now I would like to have such an interface for a multidimensional random number sequence. So let's create an interface. I now call this random number generator. So the other one, so the other one was called random number generator 1D. Maybe a better name would be random vector generator. Okay, you have to think about names um, a lot. Yeah, they are important, but maybe just use random number generator. So now my random number generator returns a vector. So if I call the get next, I will get a vector. And of course it also should tell me something about the dimension. So I would like to have a get dimension. So that's now my interface for um, a general random number generator in D dimension. And now let's implement a class that implements this interface by implementing here this algorithm. So let's call this random number generator from random number generator 1D. So I'm implementing the interface random number generator. So what properties do I need? Well, I need the random number generator 1D that should be used. So this is my random number generator 1D. And I need the dimension that should be used. So the dimension of the vector that should be generated. Okay, so let's create a corresponding constructor. So, and then this field dimension is just what I return here in get dimension. So now create the vector by populating the elements. So I create, uh, I allocate the memory for the vector. And I just populate this guy. So 
the ice component of my vector is just populated by taking the next value from the random number generator. So that's now my implementation that is taking the one dimensional sequence and generates the n dimensional sequence according to this simple algorithm. So now let's do some nice experiments with this using our one dimensional generators to generate say two dimensional sequences. So let's have a new class. Let's create it maybe in the package here, random number experiments and we call this random number generator 2D experiment. I would like to have a main method. So what I like to do now is I would like to create, say for example, a two dimensional random vector sequence from my one dimensional mesen twister sequence. So I would like to create a random number generator. So my, my interface that I just have defined. So this is a pseudo random number generator. And I use now my little helper class, the random number generator from random number generator 1D. And what I need to provide is the one dimensional random number generator. Okay, that guy should be now the Mersenne twister. Okay, say with some seed. And I specify the dimension. So dimension is two. So this here is now a two dimensional random vector sequence. And let's just plot the sample points, a few sample points for this generator. So I create here a method plot sample points. <clears throat> so I would like to plot some sample points. So my sample points is a list of the vectors. So these are my points. So let's just define here some list. Okay, so, and then how many sample points do we use? Let's take 1000 samples. So for this 1000 samples, yeah, I take the value out of my generator. Okay, so that's just to get next. I get this vector. I place the vector in this list. Okay, so I have populated here this list. Hey, what's wrong here? Ah, oh, okay. This is wrong import. So now I have a little uh, helper function that uh, creates a plot. Yeah. So there is a small helper called plots and I would like to create a scatter plot out of well a list of points okay and he likes the list of points this is the points then the x value okay that is from 0 to 1 and the y value is also from 0 to 1 yeah? and the size of the dot okay so once you have created this you can uh, say display it or save it. No, sorry, these are not integers here. These are 
floating point numbers. So, and he likes to throw some exception. Yeah, so let's just pass the exception to the outside. Okay, so I have a small program yeah, that creates 1000 sample points of my random vector. So, and if you run this, you get this picture. We saw this picture before yeah, when we looked uh, at the random number generators and we used it, for example, also to motivate the discrepancy because you see there are large empty spaces here. Okay, and sometimes you also see clusters around. Um, maybe let's make this program a little bit nicer. I can use this here for this plot with any generator. Yeah? So it doesn't need to be the pseudo one. So let's just rename this here. And um, uh, let's set the title. Yeah? So the title is just the name of the generator. So, um, so you can see here the name of the generator, and then you can just go to your implementation and modify the toString method. that we also print here the embedded one-dimensional generator that was used. Well, we could just let Eclipse do that, that for us. Okay, generate two string, and we would like to see the two fields here in the output, no? so like, like that. So if you now go back to our experiment and you run our experiment, He will now print in the title that we use Mercent Twister with dimension two. If you also go to Mercent Twister and generate here a little bit nicer two string method that, for example, just prints the name. Yeah, maybe you could also print the seed. Okay, then the title looks quite nice. So now the title in my small experiment is automatically generated from the generator that I'm using. So let's try a different uh, generator. So generator with Funda corporate sequence. So now I take the Funda corporate sequence. So let's take here our Funda corporate sequence. Say the space two to generate the two dimensional vector by just populating one element after the other. And also create a plot using now this random vector sequence for the Funda corporal sequence. Okay. So this is what we get if we use Mersen Twister. And this is what we get if we use the Funda corporal sequence. Yeah? You see, I'm using now the random number generator 1D here. Funda corporal sequence to generate the random number generator, the random vector generator. Maybe also make this title a bit nicer if you have a little bit nicer two string method in the Funda corporal sequence. So we can just well, give the base, for example, in the string, or can give the base and the count index in the string. So then if you go back to your experiment, you see that 
this is a base two um, van der Korput sequence. Okay, so we get this strange picture here. So we are not filling the space in a nice, even manner. And the reason is, of course, that, yeah, what we do in the van der Korput sequence is the first point is one half, the second point is one over four. So the first point in our vector is one half for the x value, one over four for the y value. And then this goes on. So the next point is one half plus one over four. So it is 0 0.75. Yeah. And then the, it um, switches to, for the next point to one over eight. Yeah. So I get that point here. And um, you see that there is a serial dependency. Yeah. So the next point depends somehow on the previous point in well, a very structured way so that you get here just lines you know, where this connection is reflected. So this algorithm here cannot be used anymore for the low discrepancy sequences because we lost this property that we have a sequence of independent random variables. So the next value is independent from the previous one. So what we need to do is we need to specifically write um, a low discrepancy sequence for a higher dimension. And the example here is the Halton sequence. So the Halton sequence is just the fun of corporate sequence in higher dimensions. So instead of one parameter base, I'm now considering multiple parameter base for each dimensions. So I have dimension is equal to D. So I'm looking at generating a sequence in the unit hypercube zero one to the power of D. And I'm taking base values B1 to BD such that BJ and BK have greatest common divisor one. Yeah? So in other words, they are co-prime. Well, this means that, okay, I do not find a connection yeah, such that um, if I have a value in base B, yeah, which is something like a one divided by B to the power of K, say B1 to the power of K, so base B1, uh, then I do not find um, a multiplicative direction, such a linear line with the other base, yeah, one divided by B2. So then if I create for each dimension a van der Korput sequence. So we create for each dimension here, a van der Korput sequence with base BJ. Then this is called the Halton sequence. So our vector XI has elements xij in zero one, such that xij, so the j's component, is a van der Korput sequence with base pj. Let's try and implement this. So I need to work a little bit. I need to create a specific implementation for a higher dimensional low discrepancy sequence. So I implement now the Horton sequence and the interface I like to implement is now the random number generator, yeah? the random vector generator, if you like. Okay, so um, I could maybe just copy here 
this code yeah, that creates the Fanta corporate number because that is just uh, what I need. Or alternatively, yeah, maybe good not to have too much code duplication. I could just uh, use that. So what do I need as a property for this generator? I need, of course, the vector. of base values, okay. Let's create a constructor for this. So then I can create a Horton sequence with these different base values. Actually, if you now are uh, yeah, a very responsible programmer, uh, you should maybe do some checks. For example, here, you should check that all the provided values are co-prime. Otherwise, you can throw an illegal argument exception. Maybe the same here Yeah, for the Fanta corporate sequence. In the constructor, you should maybe check that the base is uh, larger than one. Yeah? Otherwise, you should throw an exception. In the code that you find in the repository, actually, I'm doing a little bit more of this. But here to save time, yeah, I'm sometimes um, skipping this. So I'm not checking the, in the input value. Well, the dimension is just the length of this vector of bases. Yeah? So I do not need an additional parameter. I can just return here the length. Yeah? So I'm done. And here I now populate uh, the vector. I allocate the value with my dimension and I populate the vector. So now I need to call the van der Korput algorithm that generates for a given index this number. So I need the index. And we do the same as we did here for, for the Van der Korput sequence. We have just a running index. There is a state. So this class, this object has state. There's a state that counts here the index. I also use this atomic integer to make it thread safe. Okay, so now my current index is is that, yeah? So I'm using a local field, yeah, because otherwise if I use it multiple times, it wouldn't be thread safe. So now I can call this Fanda Corput sequence function, yeah? So it's, well, this argument is the base. Okay, this is basis for the corresponding dimension. And this is my index. I hope that's now my Horton sequence, okay? So I'm using a van der Korput sequence in each dimension, yeah? So I is the dimension. Each dimension has a different base. The uh, requirement is that the base numbers, so these integer numbers are co-primes. So you could use two, three, five, seven, yeah, 13, and so on. Yeah? So you have to use these different values for the base. Let's add this new guy now to our small experiment. So now I have a random number generator. This is now my quasi random number generator, one that uses the low discrepancy sequences. And I just used the new Halton sequence with dimension two, but dimension is now implicit because I just specify the base values. Okay, the base values, let's call it, let's use here two and three. Okay, and we can also plot the graph 
for this guy. Yeah. Maybe to have the plot with a nice title, I provide here um, a two string method. And well, the count index is not so important. Yeah? So maybe just print out which base numbers we used. And maybe also remove here. this part from the front code. So now let's run our experiment with these three guys. Okay, so this here is the Halton sequence with space two and three, the van der Korput sequence with space two in dimension two, and your mesentwister. Okay, and you see that this fills the space quite nicely, yeah? So he's using 0.5, and then in the other sequence, he is using one over three. So he's using 0.5, one over three. So this guy here is actually the first point, yeah? Uh, then he's using one over four in the first sequence, but the other sequence will move to two over three. So he will use, one over four, two over three. So somewhere here, this guy is the next point. Okay, and he's filling the spaces. And you see, because these are co-primes, the times when the sequences switch to the next level well, are not synchronized. Yeah? So that's now the nice feature. If you like, you can also print another Halton guy. Let's have here another one, say this three and five and you can maybe play a little bit at home with this also check what happens if it's not co-prime okay so now it looks like that you see that this here is still a bit structured yeah there is structure you sometimes see some some lines yeah but he's filling the space quite evenly and you see that the areas where you have for example gaps are smaller yeah? and it's maybe also nice to create this picture now with with more points let's create maybe another picture the guy when this is not co-prime so for example what happens if you take uh, 5 and 15 yeah that's not co-prime the other one is three times the guy. Okay, and you see then it fails. Yeah, So that would be five and 15. And you have some link yeah, between the guy. Uh, so every, for example, the time when the other sequence is switching to a new refinement level is something like three to the power of K something of the other one. Yeah, so they are synchronized. So if you take higher values, say for example, like five and 13, yeah, so these are co-prime. You see that he's filling the space evenly, but there is structure. But if you now take more points, yeah, we can also to you see maybe 10,000 points. Now you still see that we get every point in our unit cube. Okay, so that's um, a nice sampling now of the two dimensional space. Okay, so this is uh, checked in, yeah, feel free to play with this. It's sometimes nice to get an intuition for what is going on, the Horton sequence. Here you have the algorithm in the script. We already discussed this, it's the same algorithm as for the van der Korput sequence. And for the Horton sequence, you may prove that the discrepancy um, is log n to the power of d divided by and at least this is an upper bound. Yeah, um, it's 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 still an open problem. Yeah, if this bound uh, is sharp, uh, at least for dimension three and higher. Yeah, 
I believe it's proved for uh, dimension two. Okay, you see that this um, convergence rate is better than the one which we get from the random sequence, the Monte Carlo one, our one divided by square root of n for n large. Um, but you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I mean, we do not know the constant here. And as far as I know, the constant is uh, small. Uh, so, and you have to take maybe that into account if you consider a fixed N. But let's for a moment, just consider a fixed N. Let's consider maybe 10 million, something which you would maybe use for a Monte Carlo in a computer. So that's a 10 to the power of seven. And also consider that here the logarithm is um, the log base 10, because otherwise that would just create another constant. Then you have that the log of n, you know, this is a 10 to the seven, this is just a seven. And you can ask yourself, okay, for which dimension is seven to the power of d divided by n actually better than a one divided by square root of n? Okay, so you have that this is the same as seven to the power of d should be smaller than square root of n. And that's the same as d should be smaller. Okay, take again the logarithm, take a log 10, log 10 of square root of n divided by log 10 of seven. So this means that the d should be smaller. Uh, log 10 of square root of n is one half the seven. So this is 3.5 and a log 10 of seven. Okay, a log 10 of 10 would be a one. Yeah, okay, that's a little bit smaller than one. So this guy here is approximately a 4.1. So you see that the Horton sequence, if this constant here would be a one, actually it's much smaller would only be better in dimension one, two, three, four. After that, in the higher dimension, the true Monte Carlo, the random guy, the one over square root of n is uh, better. Uh, so yeah, you have to be a little bit careful uh, yeah, with the in interpretation. If really this sequence is much better than using just a true random number sequence. To conclude this session, maybe one last remark here. Um, we have here the log n. And if we go back to the van der Korput sequence, so the case d equals one, so for the van der Korput sequence, the case d equals one, we know that the discrepancy is log n divided by n. But on the other hand, if you just remember how we constructed the sequence, for example, with base two, yeah, it was one half and then one four over four, one half, three over four. Yeah. It was a repeated refinement and whenever you reach n equals b to the power of k, so when I reach, say, one point, yeah, uh, then uh, the three points, four points, then I actually, it's minus one, right? n is b to the power of k minus one. So sorry, that should, that should be a minus one. Okay, 
Okay. So when, whenever you reach the point just before the next refinement level starts, you know that you have an equipartitioning of the interval. And at that point, the van der Korput sequence has discrepancy one over N. Okay, so if you go back to the van der Korput sequence, you see this here is a perfect partitioning. And that here would be also a perfect partitioning, but in between we have the choice where to place the point, okay? So we place it here, and then the next one, we place it here. So we are moving to the next refinement level. And now you could think, okay, why is actually this log n divided by n standing there? I mean, isn't it just a two times? Because until I reach the next refinement level, I need twice as many points. Um, the reason is that if you, If you look at this and you start, for example, just by refining from the left to the right, the discrepancy of this here, where you have placed one half of the points already in the refinement, so one area is refined, the other is not refined. The discrepancy of this here can grow. Okay, so the discrepancy of this is larger than the discrepancy of this. And for that, it's maybe also nice to do a small experiment. Okay, so maybe just look at this example. Uh, so I'm, I have the refinement one over two, and then I'm doing the refinement one over four and one over two plus one over four. Okay. And then I ask myself, okay, should I just do the next refinement level, which is one over eight, just walking from the left to right. So one over eight, three over eight, or should I place the guys as the van der Korput sequence does it here. And then I place the next one here. If you look at these guys, uh, it's nice to just plot here the function that we used when we discussed the discrepancy. So you saw that we can define the discrepancy by this maximum uh, if the point X is not already counted, subtracted from the value of x, which corresponds to the measure, or if the point of x is already counted and subtract the measure. So this guy here is checking the cases where we have too few points. Uh, and then I add another point and I'm checking against the case where I have too many points. So you can just implement this formula and you can also just implement this function here, which is just, okay, so one of these guys. Yeah, so this is, this function and check what happens if you place these points in a different way. So I already prepared this experiment. You can find it here, discrepancy experiment in our um, repository. So let me check that. Okay. And what I've done here is um, I created a small function that plots the discrepancy. So this is just this function X minus count the number of points that came before, not including X. Okay, so maybe you can study this code in more detail, but that's just the function that you saw on the script. And I'm then plotting this function for different values X. So that's one part here. And the other part is that I just calculate the discrepancy for a given list of sample vectors. Okay, how do I calculate the discrepancy? Well, I'm sorting 
this list and then I go from left to right and in my formula I'm calculating the two parts of this maximum so the first one is lambda of 0 to x this is just dx minus how many points were before not included the one which I'm looking at so the count is still zero then increasing the count and checking the other side so how many points did I count divided by the number of points minus the lambda from zero to x okay and the maximum of the two is this term and the discrepancy is the maximum over all these guys so now we have a nice little analytic tool one plots the function and the other one prints the discrepancy and let's do that for different cases so the first case is i use five points from a mersenne twister or i use five points from a van der Korput sequence or seven points from a van der Korput sequence or nine points from a van der Korput sequence and then the two examples which were in the script, I use the five, five points like in the van der Korput sequence, but I'm not doing the refinement as in the van der Korput, I'm refining from left to right. So one over eight, two over eight, three over eight, and then the middle point, two over four, and the other half is not yet refined. Or I place here this um, refinement point uh, three over eight, yeah, I leave it out. And I place it on the other side, yeah, to have to just fill this gap here. Let's run this little experiment. And then we also understand this log of n term that the discrepancy in between can grow. Okay, so these are now my pictures. So first one is just here my Merzen twister, yeah, with the five points. Well, he's sometimes placing many points here, so this function will go down. Yeah, and he will maybe count that guy here as a discrepancy. Then he has two few points, yeah, so the function will go up, and here, yeah, maybe that guy is then counted as the discrepancy. So there are two few points here in the middle region. So I get a discrepancy of 3.4. If I use the Van der Korput sequence also with five points, I'm placing the points here at these guys here, yeah, one over four, one over eight, one over two, and so on. Discrepancy is much better, is 0.25. Um, you see that this zigzag curve is becoming smaller in size if you add more points. So van der Korput with seven points here increases the discrepancy. So here's one over four. Here it is one over uh, over eight. Yeah. So this is the the next refinement level is filled up. Yeah. So this is uh, two to the power of three and eight minus one. So then the refinement level has been filled up completely. The surprising thing is that if you now move to n equals nine, the discrepancy can increase. And this is the reason why you have this log of n term. Yeah. Uh, so the next discrepancy is one over 16 if the refinement has been completed but in between it may happen that the discrepancy increases and the reason is that if you for example add here a point yeah the bump that is going down is smaller but this will increase the curve for all the later points so it's not a local effect and you have to look at where the discrepancy is large and add the new point there if it is large due to missing points or if the discrepancy is large 
like for example here because you have many points you should not start adding a point there yeah because um yeah it, it will have um, a, a bad effect on on the the other side um okay so nice example so you see this now if you just just look at the two different refinement schemes so here i am placing many points to the left side before I fill the right hand side. And this means that I'm jumping down here. I'm often counting points. So the discrepancy already has reached here a very low level. And then it moves linearly up yeah, with these few points. So you see it's much better to just take out this guy here. So not jump down here. So I go up here. So you go up here, yeah, such that the discrepancy moves back to the zero. And then you add um, another point, well, here. So you see, for this refinement from left to right, I get discrepancy 0.3. For the van der Koppel sequence refinement, I get a better discrepancy. Okay, so this guy here comes from the in-between refinements, uh, uh, not having the property that I can keep the perfect level one over n uh, when I'm doing these refinements. Okay, so this exercise is just what we did when we calculated here um, the corresponding D uh, to get an intuition. Uh, well, when is this sequence really better? Of course, this is just um, a rough estimate. Yeah, you have to be aware that here that this constant really matters a lot. And as a last remark on low discrepancy sequences, you saw that maybe here the Horton sequence you know, is maybe not perfect yeah it really depends on here how this constant is and there are other sequences which are even better for example sobol numbers i just want to give you here the reference to this okay so here in the script you find the reference for our little experiments with the plot yeah? so we created here these three pictures you also find the three pictures in the script And um, I would like to conclude here now with this little experiment that illustrates that we can use the Monte Carlo method very nicely to calculate the integral in parallel. Yeah, I had this example Monte Carlo approximation of P already a bit earlier in the script. Okay, so that's um, a classic example yeah, for Monte Carlo integration. So the area of the unit circle, so if you look here at the unit circle, so I have that the area of a circle is P R squared yeah, and for R equals one. So the unit circle radius one, this is just P. So if I calculate the area of the unit circle, then this is just P. So the area of the unit circle is just the integral from minus one to one in every component. And then just the indicator function is XY inside the circle or outside the circle. So here is my unit circle and I'm just integrating now this area here by calculating the two-dimensional integral from minus one to one in every component and just integrating the indicator function. So that should be equal to P. If you do that with the Monte Carlo, it means that you just sample random points here 
and you just count, are you inside or outside? You count the number of points inside, you divide by the total number of points, and that should be an approximation of P. So I generate random numbers between zero and one. So I need to transform the integral domain here a little bit. So I can just use four times the interval zero to one. So I just do a substitution. So the substitution is move X, which is between zero and one, shift it to the left yeah, with one half. Okay, so then it's between minus one half and one half, and then multiply it with two. Okay, and this rule of substitution gives me a du by dx, okay, which is equal to a four. So I have four times integrating from zero to one, the indicator function on this argument here, random number x, x between zero and one, uh, minus one half multiplied with two, and random number y, y between zero and one, minus one half multiplied with two. No. And then checked if this is inside the unit cube by checking this condition. Let's um, have a look at this. Okay, I do not have enough time to, to do the coding uh, now live, yeah, but it's quite easy. And let's uh, use this example here to illustrate a little bit that we can now parallelize the Monte Carlo integration, uh, calculating on a multi-core machine, the integral in parallel by splitting the summation into different parts. So for the parallelization, yeah, we have to make maybe a few remarks. So the Monte Carlo method in its original form uses here independent, identically distributed random variables. Yeah, this, and this is somehow crying for parallelization because I can split it due to the independence into independent parts so I can perform these partial calculation independently. Sometimes in the literature you find that such a property is called embarrassingly parallel. So the problem is embarrassingly parallel. The problem already comes with independent parts that can be calculated independently. With rest to a random number sequence, the problem is very not so embarrassingly parallel because I generate here a random number sequence, xi, i from zero to n minus one. And if you look at our first example, linear concurrential generators, then the next number is generated by plugging the previous number into some formula. So the calculation of the random numbers is not embarrassing parallel. Yeah, the next number depends on the previous number. So the van der Kopp sequence and the Horton sequence are much nicer because I can just calculate an element of the sequence just by knowing the index without knowing all the other guys. So with respect to the random number sequences, the parallelization looks a little bit as it, if it requires here, that we can easily construct subsequences for the quasi random number sequences, the van der Korpel sequences. This is the case because we can just generate the subsequence by just knowing the index for which we would like to calculate the element. So here, for example, the subsequences have length m. Uh, and I'm using k sequences of length m. So I have k times m should be equal to n. Uh, and k is then uh, the number of blocks. Uh, and I have blocks j from 0 to k minus 1. 
So not all random number sequences have this property. So the van der Korput sequence or Horton sequence, they allow to explicitly calculate the element xi as a function of i. So this is, okay, nice. This allows me to split this. Um, some algorithms, for example, for linear con uh, concurrential generators also have formulas that allows this. It's called skip ahead. Yeah? So you can immediately jump to the element that is uh, at a later point in the future. And once you have this element, you can of course use the formula that creates the next element from the previous element. So I have here um, a reference where you can find this. Yeah, it's because the modulus that appears in the linear concurrential generator has certain properties if you apply it to these skips. Um, another important aspect is if you use a single generator, like for example, our van der Korput sequence from multiple thread in the computer, so you use it in parallel, then the calculation has to be thread safe. So that means when you program this, you have to think that the formula that you are implementing is used in parallel. Let me give you a short example for how subtle this can be. We implemented here our Horton sequence. And I implemented it in this way. Yeah? So I'm using here my index, yeah, I'm getting the index and incrementing this. And you know that this method here is thread safe. So it's performing the get of the index and then the increment in a single atomic block. So this is why it's called atomic. So I have the index and then I can use this index in this formula. Uh, you could also do the following, which is not a good idea. You could just here use the index. Okay. And then in the end, when you are done with this, increment this. Okay. That code is actually equivalent. It would also work. Yeah. But the reason is when now two guys are simultaneously calling the next but not, not really simultaneously. The other one is just a nanosecond after the other one, say for example. Then the first one is calling here all the gets. Yeah? And then he is calling the increment, but maybe the second one is also calling the gets before the other one has called the increment. So maybe if you have dimension 10, it can happen that the first one already, uh, the second one already asked for five of these numbers, and then the other one is finished and is incremented. Now you see there is maybe some unsynchronized way of looking at the index. Yeah? So that's a subtle thing, and you have to be careful when you think of using this in, 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 in parallel. Okay, so that's here something where you have to be a little bit careful. So if multiple parallel threads share the same generator, yeah, so then your implementation has to be thread safe. An alternative to do the parallelization is to use different generators in every parallel thread each generator using a different seat. This is also, well, a nice method. So the sequence is generated from a different seat, but you have to be a little bit careful. I mentioned that already. So it works comparably well, but it is actually not an accurate solution because you have no guarantee that two different seats will lead to sequences that are independent. Yeah? 
So if you think of linear concurrential generator where the seed is the starting value, it could just be maybe a little bit that your seed is the second value of the sequence. Then it means that you have two sequences which are just shift by one element. So they are not independent. Your two integrals are using almost the same point except for one point. Yeah, One has a different starting point. The other one has a different end point. And the two integrals are just the same. So there are different ways to do parallelization. The old school way is to use um, executors, uh, the executor framework and uh, futures. Uh, so I create different tasks and I distribute the task to um, executors that work in parallel. Um, a very nice and easy way is to use the stream, the Java stream and just use the parallel keyword. To ensure threat safety, one last remark, uh, there are yeah, diff different aspects. So one aspect is that a variable is not shared across different threats. So these variables are called threat local. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting the index and I'm copying it into a new variable. So every call to get next will create here a new copy of the current index and work with that, then increment it such that the other one gets another copy. So this is called thread local. Also, if every worker has its own random number generator, the random number generator is then local to the thread. Or if you have a variable that is shared among threads, then you could synchronize the access to it. You can place the word synchronize around uh, with a curly bracket and you are sure that only one guy is working on this block at a time. So I would like to uh, do the approximation of P via the Monte Carlo integration. And uh, I have prepared here um, a small example. Uh, one example is with the Horton sequence. One example is with Mersenne Twister and I'm using sequential streams. So not parallel, parallel streams and the executor framework. So you find this here in our repository again. Okay, usually location, there is a package called parallelization experiments. And I just want to step very quickly through the code because time is up. Um, and you can maybe play a little bit with this and I just explain some, uh, some things. Okay, so let's maybe just comment these guys here out and just look at the first part, the integration with the Horton sequence. So I'm, you, this is the four times coming from the rule of substitution. And then I'm creating an integer stream of number of sample points. And I'm mapping the index to, well, I draw two random numbers. This is my X, the XI, and this is my Y, the YI, I'm using a Horton sequence with base two, a Van der Koppel sequence with base two in the first dimension with base three in the second dimension. Okay, then shifted by one half, multiplied with two to map it to the inter interval from minus one to one, and then check if I'm inside the circle or if I'm outside the circle. Then this indicator function is summed up and divided by the number of sample points. Yeah, you can maybe just run this and you see that he will now calculate the approximation of P. I'm using here fairly many sample points. Yeah, I'm using 200 million sample points. So this takes quite a while. While it's calculating, let's take a look at the next example. The next example is the same, doing it in parallel. And the nice thing is that you see that the next example is 
just the same code. Okay, so this here is line by line the same code. Yeah, I, the index maps to xi, yi, check the indicator function, take the sum, divide by the number of sample points. And there's just a single word changed. There is a dot parallel here. So you can tell the stream that he can operate in parallel on the stream. So if the word parallel is here, it will lead to the effect that um, this function evaluation is done in parallel, which is okay because my Halton sequence function here just can calculate this in parallel. And also the summation is done to some extent in parallel. So this cost here 25 seconds. Let's do it with the parallel stream. So while he's calculating, the third example is the one with Mersenne Twister. So I'm generating here a Mersenne Twister. So this is also sequential. So there's no word parallel here. And I'm just asking the Mersenne Twister two times for the next random number. And I'm calculating the same. Same integral. So you see all the codes are just the same. So you already see that I gain here yeah, a factor three or four uh, in speed by just placing the simple word parallel here and showing that I can work in parallel. So the next two examples are the Mersen sequential and the Mersen in parallel. Okay. And maybe let me for a second comment that out. And let me run now the Mersenne also in sequential and in parallel with this. So the first one takes some time. Yeah, it was. 25 seconds, by the way, if you would like to have a look at my processors, yeah, these are here my processors, you can see if he's working in parallel or if he's working sequentially on this. Okay, so now he's looking, using all the processors for a short time and he's working in parallel. So what you see is that the Mersenne Twister in sequential order is even faster than the Halton in parallel. The reason is that the Mersenne algorithm to generate the next number is, well, much simpler than to gen generate this van der Korput number. And the van der Korput number, the complexity becomes higher and higher as the index becomes higher and higher. So the Mersenne is a very fast algorithm. Okay, so maybe I just keep the first one out and let that run again. <clears throat> so this is now the parallel Halton. Then this is the sequential Mersen. And this is the parallel Mersen. Here, I comment the synchronized out. Okay. So with the parallel Mersen, actually, we are not 100% sure if this here is thread safe. Huh? And depending on which implementation of the Mersen you use, yeah, it can be that this is not thread safe. So actually, you should use maybe here a synchronize such that you are sure that no two guys enter in this loop at the same time. If you don't do this, yeah, it can, the calculation can fail or the following can happen. Um, you see, I get here the same integration error at 10 to the minus four for the two, but with the synchronization, I'm even slower in the parallelization because he's, he's actually blocking 
the parallelism. If I allow the parallelism, it may happen that he is getting one number for the X, then the other guy is getting one number for the X, then the next guy is getting the number for the Y, and the other guy is getting the number for the Y. So actually, this parallelism will scramble the sequence, and we do not get the same number. And this is the reason why I even get here a different error. So looking at the generator in parallel, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, I also have two examples that use the executor framework. So the executor framework is that looks here a little bit more complicated. I'm first generating the calculation task to get approximation of the pi with the mesen, and I'm doing that with different seeds. Uh, um, for the Horton sequence, it's much nicer. I'm doing that for different starting values. So I create these blocks. You can look at this code in more detail, but I just want to let that run. This is far more efficient than the parallelization using these streams, because he then has a large block and can work on this block uh, in parallel. Okay, so maybe that's now the last um, example here. Let's do all the calculations with 200 million numbers. Now the first one is the stream sequentially. You see the processors you know, are not doing much. After 25 seconds, we get the result. Then the streams in parallel, uh, all the processors worked on it. The summation cannot use all the parallelism. Yeah. Then the mesen using the sequential stream, the mesen using the parallel stream, but using synchronization, which destroys all the parallelism because he will block it. It even takes longer. Now my executor framework and the executor framework on the Mersenne twister. You st also see that here you get also a different approximation error because I'm doing that with different seeds. Yeah? So it's not the same sequence, but this method is really blazingly fast. Yeah? It's half a second for 200 million sample points. Okay, so that was it for today. You can study this little uh, code here with the parallelization maybe in more detail and we have an approximation of P, yeah? So this is the error compared to the analytic value. That was it for today. Thanks.